Mm-hmm. At that time, we're going to search out from God's w- uh, word the ways in which each Christian should be occupied with God's word. In the Bible, we're admonished to hear the word, and we're admonished to read the word, we're admonished to study the word, and we're admonished to meditate upon the word. And we'll take these four uh, occupations with God's word and and, uh, try to relate them to your own time in searching the scriptures and show uh, why each of these is important and just how to make uh, each of these effective in your own Christian life. So that will be in December. And then our plans in January are to uh, uh, search the prophetic scriptures again. And this time, uh, more or less in relationship to the nation of Israel, we'll uh, uh, tie in their present situation and uh, try to understand what happens next there and just uh, what is God's program uh, for those people. And of course, uh, we'll relate your own uh, time and life to that also. So those are our plans for the next uh, two months. For our lesson tonight, let's turn to the Gospel of John, the ninth chapter. John chapter 9. We will read here in the early part of this chapter an episode which occurred just a very few months before the Lord was crucified. And it happened in the city of Jerusalem, where we read, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That was a common belief at that time, that sin individual sin was always uh, punishment for sinful individual sickness that is or affliction was punishment for individual sins and uh, since this man was born blind uh, the uh, disciples were somewhat uh, perplexed uh, as to uh, why his blindness Uh, could he have sinned before he was born or did God uh, placed the blindness upon him because he knew he would be such a sinful man or to keep him from going into such gross sin. So was it his sin or was it the parent's sin that caused his blindness? In the third verse, the ninth chapter of John, Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, The Lord Jesus did not mean here that the man was sinless. Neither did he mean that the parents were sinless. For the Bible plainly teaches that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But he means that the blindness was not due to the individual sin of either the blind man or his parents. He says, rather, God permitted this man to be blind for a purpose, and that purpose had to, be, uh, had to do with the manifestation of the works of God, or the glory of God. Now we see this also two chapters later in the 11th chapter, and you'll remember here the story of Lazarus, who lived in the little town of Bethany, just outside the east gate of Jerusalem, and you'll remember that when the Lord came to Jerusalem, three times a year, or each of the feast times, that he didn't spend the night in the city, but he always went outside the city, and many times he stayed in the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He loved them very much, and he heard that Lazarus was sick. Notice in the uh, third verse of the 11th chapter, Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This this sickness is not unto death, 
but for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified in it. So here we see again, a man was ill not because of his personal sins, but because God had a purpose. He was going to show forth something because, uh, because or of the sickness or through the sickness. Now you remember in, in this case that Lazarus did die uh, and he was dead four days and then God rose him from the dead. We have another story in the third chapter of Acts, which is the book immediately following John here. And you'll recall this story. Uh, there was a man who had been impotent from his birth. That is to say, he couldn't, he was withered away, he couldn't walk. And he'd been this way for 40 years, and his friends brought him just outside the gate beautiful, or the eastern gate of the temple, and uh, laid him there because that's where the religious people went back and forth, and he thought maybe they would be more generous. And uh, you'll remember, he saw uh, Peter and John come in, and so he asked them uh, for alms. And uh, you'll remember Peter said, uh, that uh, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. And uh, you remember that the man was healed, and he jumped up, he received his strength immediately. And we find out in the fourth chapter of Acts, in the 21st verse, the purpose of his illness. So when they had further threatened them, that is the uh, religious leaders threatened Peter and John, so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people, for all glorified God for that which he had done, that is, the healing of this man by the gate. So you see here we have three afflicted people. We have a man blind from his birth, uh, a man who grew sick unto death, and uh, then we have a man uh, who was uh, lame, so lame that he couldn't care for himself, lame from his birth. In each case, we're told that the sickness was so that God might be glorified. And of course, this is the reason for some sickness today. Uh, God wants to heal that sickness. And we thankful and we glorify God because he healed our illness. It redounds unto his glory. He turns the bad thing into a good thing. But these uh, three stories have more significance than that. They glorify God also because each of them picks, uh, uh, paints a picture of just what happened to us. For instance, uh, take the blind man. You remember uh, the Lord uh, made clay and he uh, anointed his eyes. And then he says, now you go wash in the pool of Siloam, uh, which the word Siloam meant scent. Well, you see, this is a picture uh, of our being blind. Uh, God calls us blind. Uh, the Satan, Satan has blinded our eyes that we can't see the glorious wonders of God that shine from the face of Jesus Christ. And what happens is when we meet Jesus, Jesus sees us in our blind condition and he anoints our eyes with eye salve. That is, he applies his remedy. But notice, he also gave uh, the blind man something to do. He said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And it said that he went and washed and came back seeing. Now, you see, God applies the wonderful gospel message with the utilizing vessels of clay. He applies that to our blindness. We can't see. Uh, and, and he applies it to our blindness. And then he says, if you want to wash, if you want to see, go wash. Well, you see, Siloam means scent, and the Holy Spirit of God is the scent one. He's the one who cleanses us with the washing of regeneration. And so we must act upon what we hear. We must act upon what we receive by faith. And then we receive that. Now, you see, this blind man had to exercise some faith, didn't he? He was not cured of his blindness when the eye salve was applied. He was cured of his blindness when he went and washed. And then he came seeing. 
And later on, you'll remember the Jewish leaders uh, uh, tried to discredit it all. And he says, yeah, who is this man? He says, this man that uh, uh, did this to you, he's a sinner. And uh, so our blind man who now saw, he said, well, whether he's a sinner or not, I know not. But I know this one thing, whereas I was blind, now I see. And this is our story, whereas we were blind. This is our testimony. We may not understand all that happened to us, but we know we were blind and we know we see. So you see, this story tells that tale. And then God says we are dead in trespasses and sin. And the story of Lazarus is the story of when the, the risen Christ speaks to our own heart and says, Come forth calls our name he knows us by name and he calls our name and says come forth and we throw off the the grave clothes as it were and we walk in newness of life so here again we have a picture of salvation by jesus christ and then we have uh in in acts this story of the lame man and this speaks of the fact that although we're involved right in the center of religion now this man you see lived in the religious capital of the world and he looked upon and was seen by the greatest religious leaders in the world but he still for 40 years remained impotent so religion couldn't do a thing for him could it there was nothing that religion had that could could offer this man any any help at all but you see the power of god could and so this is a picture of in our own impotence Although we would wait at the very gates of the temple, except we hear the glad message of Jesus Christ and place our faith in him, we would remain impotent. But when we hear it, uh, then we leap up rejoicing within our souls. So you see, all three of these stories glorify God in that they picture what happened to the sinner when he comes to salvation. So one reason, then, why people are ill is because God has in mind in the long run to bring glory out of it. But there are other reasons. Uh, for instance, let's turn to the book of 1 Corinthians. Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. Two more books over. And let's turn to the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30 where we read, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now, if we had read the whole story of Lazarus being raised from the dead, we would have found that when the Lord Jesus described his state in death, he called it sleeping. God calls uh, Christians, he says we're asleep when we uh, go to the grave. And it doesn't mean our soul is sleeping or our spirit is sleeping because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. But our bodies sleep in the ground. And this is why death is referred to uh, as sleep. So it says here that some Christians, for some reason, it says for this cause. Now we need to explore for what cause. It says for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. Did you know that many Christians are in ill health. They're sick in soul and body, both, because they misuse worship. Or that is to say, they don't recognize the holiness of worship. Now, the epitome of a worshipful act, act is the partaking of the Lord's Supper. And particularly, uh, what these Christians were doing wrong uh, involved this. Uh, they were coming to their, their place of meeting and they were not conducting themselves in the right way. And Paul said they weren't discerning the holiness of what they were doing. Let's look back up at the 26th verse of 1 Corinthians 11. It says, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat that bread and drink that cup. For he that eateth 
and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation, or this word is better translated judgment, eateth and drinketh judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now how do we today uh, partake of the Lord's Supper unworthily? Well, first, we fail to even search in to the depth of the significance of the occasion. You see, bread is representative of this broken body. For in order to have a loaf of bread, the grain must die, as he said before he went to the crucifixion, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die. It remaineth alone. But he was speaking of the fact that he had to die in order to give life to us. Well, this is significant. See, the grain of wheat must die. It must be crushed as his body was crushed. And then it's put into an oven and baked just as his life was baked in the fires of judgment for, the, for our sin that was laid upon him. So it's a picture of what happened to Christ. And then when we partake of the bread, no matter how little the piece of the bread is, it permeates our entire body. It becomes a part of us, doesn't it? The nourishment in that bread goes, becomes one with us. Well, in the same way, through the death of Christ and through his suffering and through uh, his uh, receiving the judgment for our sins, he becomes one of us. His life is imparted to us just like that bread would impart life to us. So it stands for his body. And he says, this is the way I want you to remember me. Then we take the fruit of the vine. And the fruit of the vine it comes about because the grape is crushed as he was crushed. And by the same way, when you take that uh, fruit juice into your body, it goes throughout your body into all your veins just as a person's blood does. And so, therefore, it's a very good picture of his blood. See, the bread is a picture of his flesh, and the, uh, uh, the grape juice or the fruit of the vine is a picture of his blood. And he says, by partaking in this uh, ceremony, you are remembering my death until I come. And I want you to do this. And as often as you do, I want you to remember. It's a remembrance service. Now, so one way Christians eat and drink uh, unworthily is not discerning what they're doing. And God will give you light on that most holy occasion. Another way we, uh, we fail to discern it is by partaking of the Lord's Supper with those who we know are not the children of God. This is an occasion that's supposed to be entered into only by those who are truly born again, who are members of God's family. I know uh, little groups of Christians all over this world, uh, all over this country. I meet with some of them, and uh, I have uh, the Lord's Supper with some of them. And maybe there's no real uh, fundamental uh, church in their community, and maybe they feel like the Lord has them attending some large uh, church for a reason uh, of service. But they don't take that as their worship. And they gather around, maybe in a home or something, and just break bread and drink of the fruit of the vine together, remembering the, remembering the death of the Lord. You see, we have got ourselves in the, such a, a system in our worship that we'd rather follow through on the formality than we would uh, honor God in our actions. Now, if you can, if you read the early chapters of the book of Acts, it will be very plain to you that the Christians often met together in very small groups. When one group of Christians would come uh, to, another, to the home of another Christian, they would sit down and they would break bread and they would drink the fruit of the vine that they might remember the Lord's Supper. And they didn't have to be on a Sunday, although it came uh, later to where this was usually done on the Lord's Day. However, no group was too small, and they didn't have some sort of a, uh, a religious hierarchy whereby only certain ones were able to uh, uh, 
serve the uh, elements, you might say. No, it was just a time when a group of Christians would come together and say, let's just have a little remembrance service. And it may only last five minutes, and then they might sing songs, or they might fellowship around the word or so forth. But it was not a formal thing. And I know groups of Christians today, uh, maybe in the big church that they attend, which they don't think is, is true to God and where there might be as many unsaved people as there are saved people, the, the very Sunday that they know uh, the, the communion service is scheduled, they don't know that Sunday. But they meet together in little groups because they want to partake of the elements with God's people. And so we must be very careful about this thing. Now, if you think that you may be partaking of the Lord's Supper unworthily, I'll tell you what you do about it. You go to the Lord in prayer and you say, Lord, I read in the Bible that those who worship you must worship in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. And Lord, I would want to uh, perform this holiest of, of uh, worship activities the way you would want me to. And I want enlightenment on this and I want you to teach me and I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do that I might observe in that way and then just be patient the Lord will guide you and lead you he's more interested in this than you are and then make no hasty decisions uh, or anything like that but examine yourself and be sure that your heart's right about it and that you honestly sincerely regardless of tradition Regardless of what other people might say, you honestly and sincerely want to be engaged in this ceremony or this remembrance service God's way. I was talking to some Christians this, this last week. And uh, they go and uh, have a remembrance service with a group of Christians. They're not members of the, that particular church or anything. But they never go to the church where their their name happens to be on the roll. Uh, and when when they're going to have the uh, remembrance service there, the Lord's Supper there, which is only once a quarter, and they say the reason they don't go because their soul is grieved when they see so many around that don't even profess to be saved. They have they make no profession whatsoever. If you were ask them on the street, are you a child of God? They'd say, Well, I don't guess I am. And yet, because it has become a form or formality, they sit there and all together sit around the Lord's remembrance service. And this is only for his own. I, I firmly believe it's better not to partake at all than to partake under the wrong circumstances. I honestly believe that. So we should pray about this. After all, for whom are you doing this if it's not for the Lord? Well, if it's for the Lord, we must do it His way if, if we're going to expect Him to accept it, right? Well, let's see what the Scripture says. Let's search the Scriptures and to see. So, some are sick. Some Christians are sick and have infirmities because they just refuse to be exercised towards God's own explanation of this simple remembrance service. All right, let's find uh, other reasons. Let's turn to the next book, the book of 2 Corinthians, the first chapter. And here we have the third reason why Christians are sick or afflicted. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3 Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us, who comforteth us in all our tribulation or trials or testings, that we may be able to comfort them who are in any way in trouble by the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now this is what he means. Some of you Christians are mature Christians. You've lived with the Lord a long time. You understand his ways. And if you uh, underwent a hardship, if, uh, if some type of a 
uh, an affliction or a pressing trial came into your life, your attitude would be, well, God, I know you love me too much to hurt me, and God, I know you're too wise to make a mistake. And so I accept this from your hand. I accept the pain. I accept the pressure. I accept it all from you. And I thank you that you count me worthy because I know that you have a good purpose. See, you trust your Lord and you show your trust in times of pressure. You let yourself know you trust when such a time comes. But there are other Christians around you which wouldn't understand this at all. And if they had the same affliction or the same trial, they would fall before it. And they would go into the depths of despair and discouragement. And God wants you to comfort that one with the same comfort wherewith he comforts you. That is to say, since you have been through the same trial, then you have empathy towards that person who is under that trial. I'll give you an example. For six years, I was chairman of the board of a Christian retirement home in Lake Alfred, Florida, the Maranatha a Retirement Home. And several years ago, it was necessary uh, to hire a new superintendent. And we found a man who had been superintendent of a children's home for some 10 years, and he was currently a pastor uh, in, uh, in Milwaukee. And he had wanted to come to Florida because of his wife's health. So we uh, got in touch with him, and he came. He was a man that dearly loved the Lord and the Word, and, and uh, he cared for these folks. And they loved him very much. Uh, but after he was there only a few months, he was in an automobile accident and was killed on the New Jersey Turnpike. Now I remember talking to his wife uh, the day that he left because uh, I was uh, I stayed in close contact of course while he was gone and she said that although they were in their 50s and had raised a large family that she never remembered a time when they were apart before she said that uh, uh, when they were uh, managing the children's home that they always worked right together and wherever he was, she was. They went to a conference, he went to a conference, she went to it. And while he was a pastor, she was a part of his work all the time. Then when they came down there and uh, were in the retirement home, they worked together. She worked in the office and, and, and he was the, the manager. And they, they just never were apart. I know when I would come over there, if he happened to be on an errand downtown or something, I could uh, discuss the matter with her because they always had the same mind. They never had to discuss something between them. I already, I always knew whatever she thought about it, he'd think about it anyhow. And whatever he'd think about it, she'd think about it. They thought exactly alike. I guess they just lived so close together for so long. And one time I asked if they'd ever had an argument. And she thought a while and she says, well, I'm sure we have, but I don't remember when. <laughs> and uh, they just lived that close. Well, when Pastor DeBoer was killed, I was the one that had the task of going uh, and telling Tina about the death. It's a very trying time for me, but, uh, and, and it really floored her. But you know, it wasn't very long before she was just on top with the Lord again, and uh, she uh, took on the responsibility of that retirement home, and for some five years she served as the superintendent herself mm -hmm. until her health uh, uh, gave way. But you know, during that five years period, anybody anywhere around that community or many miles away that had a death in the family, especially if a wife lost her husband, they always called on Tina. She knew exactly how to comfort them. Because you see, she was a strong, mature Christian and she had been through the trial and the Lord was sufficient for her every need. Now, if she had not gone through the same trial as a pastor's wife, I'm sure, she had comforted many in the same state. But there's a difference, isn't it? When the, when the grieving one knows that you've been through exactly the same trial, it's just different. So sometimes, you mature Christians that have lived with the Lord a long time, sometimes when God sends affliction and pressure, He wants you to be able to comfort someone else. 
I'll give you another instance. I know of a mother who has a daughter who was saved as a young teenager. But uh, she, uh, the daughter, foolishly uh, fell in love and ran off and got married before she was 17. Never finished high school. And uh, after two boys were brought into the world, she and her husband were divorced. And then she married again and uh, had another child. Now she's divorced again. And uh, she's not living a Christian life at all. Now her mother was right there when she was saved and her mother uh, believed with her whole heart that this, this girl is truly born of the Spirit but that Satan has tricked her in the wilds of this world. And she says, one day I was praying to the Lord to tree, please explain to me why would you let this happen to me now dear God you are able to give me uh, a daughter who would be true to you you're the one that controls who would be born into my family why did you let this happen to me and she said the Lord let her know just as clearly that there were many other mothers that had the same trials and the same type of hard cases and she says that she is so able now to comfort the others. She says she knows one day her daughter will come back to God. She has every assurance. She doesn't have one doubt about that. God has given her that absolute assurance. And she just uh, a perfect person for anyone that has the same trial. Now you say, well, that's awfully rough on a person. Well, it's a cold, cruel world. But remember this, God will not permit anyone to be tested above that which is able, when he is able, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. But will with the temptation also send a way of escape that ye may bear. And it's a compliment for a Christian to receive trial and infirmity and sickness for the purpose of being able to comfort others. It's a compliment to them. The Lord knows that you will bear under it, and he can use you for this important ministry, and he couldn't use someone else. If he let that same thing happen to some other mother, she just spent all of her time crying in despair and said, Oh, why does God do this to me? See? And it wouldn't be any good for him to uh, use her because she couldn't comfort anybody. She can't even get herself straightened out. But you see, God knows that he has some very, very precious servants who can appropriate his strength even under the greatest trials. Now let's read this section again. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I mean chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them who are in any trouble by the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted of God. Isn't that what that says? It says some need to be comforted by us but we can be comforted by God. Now let's read on. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, Paul says, he's talking about all the true Christians, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolations, you weaker Christians, for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. For whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the suffering, so shall ye also be of the consolation. Paul says, I'm not concerned if you're subjected to suffering because I know that since you belong to God, the very fact that you're being subjected to suffering makes me know that you'll also be subjected to the comfort. 
And so he says, uh, it's all going to turn out fine. And you see, this gives us an opportunity to grow. They say that all suffering either embitters or embetters. And God knows that uh, we gain patience, we gain understanding, we gain compassion. And these are the godly elements that we need to gain in order to have high status in heaven. So here we've had three reasons why people suffer. Number one, so that God might be glorified in the healing of that suffering. Number two, because we have not been mindful of worship. Number three, so that we'll be able to comfort others. Now the fourth reason why Christians are permitted to suffer or have trials is found in the same book of 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Paul says that we're going to have a better time in heaven because we have something to compare it with. And he says uh, a person that's blind in this life is going to enjoy his sight better. And a person that is crippled is going to uh, enjoy his glorified body more. He'll have a better comparison. And so he says, your afflictions, it's really just for a moment. After all, if eternity is forever, and this life is but a few years, Paul says, in comparison, it's only for a moment. And so he says that you're only going to suffer a little while, but you're going to have the better result of having suffered forever. So he says, it's a kind thing that God does to permit you to suffer and be tested as much as you can be here, that you might have a far more eternal weight of glory. Now that's understandable. We see that uh, just in the natural realm. For instance, it's the fact that a mother is inconvenienced through carrying a child for several months and then undergoes a time of trial and suffering in delivering the child that gives her that true mother's love. As a matter of fact, if God hadn't devised that way, you'd have many more children abandoned. But some way, this makes it more precious to her. And so, it, it makes the joy of the child greater. And so, in the same way, if we have travail here, the comparison is going to heighten our enjoyment of heaven. Do you think God would let his own suffer if it weren't something good coming of it? Just like we said. He loves you too much to hurt you. And he's too wise to make a mistake. Now Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 4.17, he, he talks about our light affliction. Our light affliction. Now let's just see what he calls light affliction. Let's take the same book and go to the 11th chapter. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. He says, Of the Jews five times received thy forty stripes, save one. He says, On five different occasions the Jewish leaders took me and whipped me with a whip, thirty-nine lashes on five different occasions. He says, Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils of the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils of false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, and besides those things are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Well, here again, we can use the picture of a parent. Let's suppose, here you have a parent that uh, is uh, beset by some disease or infirmity, arthritis, we'll say. And uh, not only do they suffer the pain, but they suffer the anguish of knowing uh, that this makes them less effective in caring for their children 
and uh, uh, they uh, they have uh, uh, an added weight there. Well, Paul says, not only do I suffer all these things bodily, but he says, I, I have the pressure of all of these uh, young Christians that I care for, that press on my mind, he says, that I care for, that I have compassion for. Now, Paul calls this light affliction because he's comparing it with the glory that shall follow. And he says, in comparison, this is very light. So, we turn now to the fourth reason why Christians suffer. How many have we had so far? Got four coming? We had four already? Okay, this is the fifth one then. The fifth reason we find in 2 Corinthians 12, 7. He says, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that he might depart from me, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, Paul says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, you'll recall the story that happened here. Paul told how he had been caught up in the Spirit and, seen, and he saw marvelous things and that uh, uh, it would have caused him to be, you might have, they have a bit of spiritual pride and to humble him and to keep him humble and to keep him a better servant, God uh, let Satan attack him physically with some type of an ailment. And he says, this was a very grievous ailment. He says, I prayed three times to God. I said, God, please take this away so I can serve you better. And God let him know that he could serve him better with the affliction than he could without the affliction. And uh, so he says, uh, God says, my grace is sufficient for thee. You see, God has saving grace for sinners. He has sanctifying grace or cleansing grace for his saints and he has sufficient grace for sufferers as uh, John the Baptist said in uh, John 1.14 he says that he would be full of grace and truth and in John uh, 1.16 we're told in of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace or wave upon wave of grace now, what does all that mean? Suppose you say, well, that's great uh, for Paul, but I dread even going to the dentist. And uh, uh, I just uh, cringe when I think of suffering. And uh, if, uh, if I thought that somebody was perse going to persecute me by uh, uh, some of the things I've read about, how Christians are tortured one thing or another, I just couldn't bear up under it. I know myself, and I, uh, I would just dread something like that and I just uh, I'm just not that's that must be for Paul or somebody else because I could never stand up to it well you see you just don't, don't understand what Paul means when he says uh, that when he is weak he is strong perhaps if we turn over to the next book Galatians 2:20 you can get an idea of what Paul is saying to you Galatians 2:20 he says, I am crucified with Christ. In other words, he says, I count myself to have died already with Christ. He says, nevertheless, I live. In other words, although I count myself to have died, he says, here I am, still in the flesh. He says, yet, it's really not I that's living, but Christ is living in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith, whose faith? by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now what Paul is saying is that I don't bear up under the pain when they beat me and I don't endure the hunger when, uh, uh, when I haven't eaten for a long time. And he says, I don't feel the reproach 
when somebody persecutes or reproaches me for the name of Christ. He says, I, I, don't, I, I count myself as having been dead. He says, it's Christ that's enduring that. And he knows how to endure. He endured much worse than that on the cross. Now you see a picture of this in the ministry of uh, Stephen in the seventh chapter of Acts. Let's turn back there a moment. Acts chapter 7. Turn back a few books. And you'll get an idea of just what the Lord Jesus Christ does when the, uh, when the trial or the testing <coughs> gets difficult. You'll remember, as a matter of fact, the seventh chapter of uh, Acts is a review of the whole history of the Jewish nation by, uh, by Stephen. So if you want to read uh, the, the, whole, the whole Old Testament in condensed form, just read the seventh chapter of Acts because that's just exactly what it is. It's a summary of all God said in one sermon. It's particularly to the Jewish nation. So let's read a few of the later verses here. Let's start with verse 54, Acts 7, 54. And when they, that is the religious leaders of Israel, of, of uh, the Jewish leaders, and when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. Now watch this. And he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Now I want you to notice something. You almost never see him called Jesus after the Gospels. Starting with the book of Acts and the rest of the way through the Bible, he's nearly always called the Lord Jesus or Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus, but almost never just plain Jesus. Why? Because you see the epistles are the revelation of his present ministry. And Jesus is his earthly name. It has to do with his past ministry. Well, the only time you find him called just plain Jesus is when his humanity is being stressed. And you see, there is now a man in the heavens when he's going to look like a person, a human being, because he is a human being. He's always been God. But he became a human being. He gained a body in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And he has that same body today. When you see him, you'll see him in the very same body in which he was born. And you'll see him in the very same body in which he walked on this earth. You'll see him in the same body which hung on Calvary's cross. And you'll be able to see the nail prints in his hand you'll know that it's he. How do we know this? Because David, a thousand years before Christ was born, David prophesied that his body would not see corruption. And Peter, in his very first sermon, in the second chapter of Acts, explained this. He explained the psalm of David. And so did Paul in the 13th chapter of Acts. So three times in the Bible, you're told that his body never saw corruption. And you'll see the same body in which he lived and died. And when Stephen looked up there, he said, Behold, I see the heavens opening up. And I can, God has permitted me to look right into the heavens. And I see Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. See, he says, And the Son of Man standing. Look at the 56 verse. And, I, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then say the Son of God. See, the Son of Man was the favorite name of Jesus Christ for himself when he was here on this earth because he'd always been the Son of God. But he wanted to impress us with the fact that he had been willing to become the Son of Man. He's God, the Son of Man. Look at the 75th verse. Now he sees the Son of Man standing, standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, these are the people that were stoning him, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. Now, I understand that stoning is a very excruciating form of death, because they don't take one big boulder and smash your head with it. They just keep buffeting your body with rocks. 
until you're just one great big bruise. And it's an excruciating way to die. So it says that, uh, that they stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, or while he was calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now notice in the 59th verse, he said, Lord Jesus, you receive my spirit. How long do you think the Lord waited to receive his spirit? The Lord received his spirit right then. Now what? And he kneeled down, or his body kneeled down, and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Who do you think really said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge? <coughs> had those words ever been uttered before? Where? <laughs> On the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Luke 23, 20, uh, 34. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ had already been through this. He's not only man, but he's God. And God can stand anything. And when something terrible like this has to happen, God comes. And he takes the punishment in your body so you don't suffer in your strength you don't endure anything you yield your body over to the power of the resurrected Christ and he in his strength and in his power endures the suffering and the persecution now Paul understood this because in Colossians 1.24 he said that he counted it a privilege that his body could fill up the suffering that remained in order to bring about the body of Christ. So, what one does, a Christian does, he yields his being over to God, to God the Son. Why do you think when Jesus, uh, out of heaven, called to Paul, he says, Paul, why persecutest thou me? Well, Jesus Christ was in heaven. How could Paul persecute Christ? <coughs> because he was right there inside of every Christian who was stoned. And every Christian that Paul had a part in persecution, he was right there. That's the kind of a God we have. That's the reason the Lord says in Matthew 11, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Now, if you ever want to do the work of God, and this is what taking his yoke means, you never yoke an ox unless you want him to work. And you never place a yoke upon him unless you want him to work with another ox. And he says, you want to be yoked to me, or you want to do my work with me? Well, there's a requirement. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly at heart. In other words, I'll use your body and your facilities and your being and your will in order to do my work in the world. But you need to understand how I am, that I'm meek and lowly in heart. And I'm willing to, to do the tough part for you. If you yield to me, just yield over to me. Now you see, if we ever go through something like this, and we just yield ourselves over to our God, then nothing can faze us in this world. We walk on top of it. Because you don't, you don't fear pain if you've already experienced the ultimate in pain and his grace was sufficient. You don't fear uh, ridicule if you've already been ridiculed to the nth degree and you rejoiced in it. So you see, by going through these experiences, we get to the point where we don't fear anything. We are like the... Uh, uh, the Chinese Christians they tell about when the communists took over China and says uh, if you don't renounce Christ we'll take everything you have and he says you can't do that and they said well why can't we he says I don't have anything <laughs> he says it all belongs to my God and so if he wants you to have it it's alright with me I don't have a thing in this world he says oh, oh you're so smart 
says, well, we'll kill you. And he says, you can't. And they said, what do you mean we can't? He says, I already died. He says, I died with Christ on the cross. I've already counted myself as dead. As far as I'm concerned, I attended my own funeral. And this body belongs to God. If you want to kill his body, that's a between you and he. I don't own a body. I don't own a lot. So how are you going to do something with anybody like that? How are you going to kill somebody that's dead? And how are you going to rob from somebody that doesn't own anything? Well, you see, when God finally teaches us this, then we don't fear anything. Perfect love has casted out fear. We don't have any fear. And this is the, uh, this is our, the possibility of our attainment here on this life. Now for our last scripture tonight, let's look at uh, the book of First Peter, which is over near the, the back of the Bible. Almost to the back. First Peter chapter 4. Then what should our attitude be? How should we react? First Peter 4.12. Beloved. First Peter 4.12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Don't think like it's something strange happened to you, but rejoice in your trial. Rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. In other words, if God foresees that you will take testing and trial graciously and that this will help you to grow and be more godlike, then it will redound to your eternal glory, as we found in 2 Corinthians 4.17, and you will have a greater or more exceeding joy in eternity. 14th verse. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. And therefore he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Now I said this would be our last scripture, but I don't believe I could stop without going back to the 8th chapter of Romans and uh, showing you this one other word. And so we'll close with that instead. Romans chapter 8. First, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. In other words, the degree of our suffering here is the degree of our glorification there. 18th verse, Paul says, For I reckon, or I count upon, or I stand upon the fact that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us at that time. Amen. For the earnest expectation of the creature or the creation waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Another way of translating that 19th verse would be to say, For all of creation is waiting on tiptoe to see the unveiling of God's family. All of the angelic host, Peter said, just can't wait to see what God's going to do in the glorification of his family's children. They're just waiting on tiptoe. They know something great and wonderful is about to take place. Because you see, the angels understand more about the mind of God than we do. They've already been tested. And they know that God is always good. 
God is always wise and that God is just full of wonderful surprises and that when God uh, brings something to a conclusion that it's just going to be far better than anybody could imagine and Paul understood this too because he said the eye hath not seen or the ear heard neither has it entered in to the mind of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him it just you, we just can't comprehend it and the angels can comprehend it better than we can and they're just eagerly waiting expectantly because they said well nothing like this has happened God has not permitted the, the king of all glory Jesus Christ to go through such suffering and he's not had something going on where there was all these wars and all these uh, evil and all this so God must have something terrific in mind and we just can't wait until he brings it all into fruition so then let's not think it's strange when we have some fiery trial but let's rejoice it's our opportunity to appropriate the wave wave upon wave of God's grace it's our opportunity to gain godly characteristics so that we might enjoy heaven better for all of eternity let's pray dear God we're such children and we pray that we be occupied with your marvelous book that we might comprehend to some degree the wonders that our God has in store for us and dear God might we stop grasping at a little comfort here a little consolation here and might we keep our eyes on the glory that will be in the manifestation of God's family Amen. when we're all home with him and when we're gathered around with that rejoicing angelic host after they finally found out find out what you've had in store all of these years God teach us to appropriate wave upon wave of grace for thy grace is sufficient we pray in Jesus name Amen